Uts y Petit y bienvenidos. Para mí es un honor saludar a todos ustedes esta tarde para reconocer la sabiduría y esfuerzos artísticos de los antepasados y ancestros mayas y cómo siguen hoy en día en México, en Guatemala, Belice y en los Estados Unidos. Voy a seguir en inglés, les prometo, pero acepten mis saludos de corazón. Welcome to the Getty today, and it is an honor for me, Mary Miller, director of the Getty Research Institute, to welcome you to the first of our public events surrounding the rare and important visit to California of the oldest book in the Americas. We acknowledge the Gabrielino Tongva peoples as the traditional land caretakers of Tongvagar, where we stand or sit today. Part of New Spain, for as long as that entity existed, as well as the quarter century when it was part of the Republic of Mexico, California's history is both indigenous and Spanish and remains so today. I want to encourage you all to visit Reinventing the Americas. Our, it's not really a sister exhibition, but the Getty Research Institute exhibition, which is at the Getty Research Institute in a separate building. If you step out of the if you were standing in front of the museum and with your back to it, it would be to your left. We hope you will visit it today. Um, Reinventing the Americas, Construct, Erase, Repeat. I also want to take a minute and thank our remarkable collaborators at Cal State University, Los Angeles, who will be hosting part two, the main body of this symposium, tomorrow. And if you are wondering how to sign up for it, you can find the links on the Getty website. You can find the links, speak to anyone sitting in the front of this room at the end, and we will tell you how to attend it virtually or in person. And I also have a little bit more about housekeeping. Um, so um, today's program will be offered in English and with Spanish translation interpretation available. If you'd like to listen in Spanish and you're sitting here in the auditorium, you pick up an, a, a machine at the back of the room. For those of you listening on Zoom, you may also select your language by enabling the interpretation feature. Click the little globe icon, it's usually on the bottom left of the screen, <clears throat> and select your preferred language. You may also select the words that say mute original audio feature to avoid hearing both in English and Spanish at the same time. The book that has brought us here today embodies ancient roots of Mexico, where literature and writing flourished for 1,500 years before the Spanish invasion of the Americas, and nowhere more so than among the Maya, whose modern and ancient footprint encompasses not only southern Mexico, but also northern Central America. There were once dozens, if not hundreds, of Maya books, but by and large, they were sent to 16th century bonfires by zealots, who sought to extirpate indigenous knowledge and belief. And so in Europe, only three Maya books survived that colonial occupation. We are twice grateful to the Maya, the first time for making the book that speaks indigenous knowledge, and the second time for making the decision, perhaps when the Spanish invaded, perhaps much earlier, to secure the book in a dry cave where the conditions for survival would be optimal. Because it was discovered in 1964 by looters, the authenticity of the book was long questioned by many investigators. I had the privilege of seeing the codex in 2014 in a basement vault of the National Museum in the company of Dr. Baltasar Brito, Guardarama, director of the National Library of Anthropology and History, and who is here today. And I felt the electricity of seeing this rare original work that had long been the obsession of one of my mentors, Michael Coe. It ran right up and down my spine. Two more of his students joined Professor Coe and me in writing a 2016 study arguing for the authenticity, but we did not know at the time that Dr. Brito had launched his own campaign to study the codex. Through Dr. Brito's efforts, Mexican scientists and others working in Mexico analyzed pigments and paper and text and much more, leading to an indisputable 
circa 1100 date in a model of interdisciplinary collaboration. Their research is a scientific bridge of past to present, of Mexico to California, and on to the future. Joining us today to talk about this incredible work is Gerardo Gutierrez, Associate Professor of the Department of Anthropology at the University of Colorado. Educated first in Mexico at the Escuela Nacional, known as the ENA, and at Colegio de México, before receiving his Penn State at university, he began to, fo to focus, long before his studies on the Maya Codex, on material science of ancient works. Much of his work before studying the Maya Codex had been to look and work with 16th century documents and modern archaeology of the Tlapa Tachinolan region of Guerrero. Skills in interpreting the deep past with modern technology along with colonial documents made him the ideal collaborator on the Codice Maya de Mexico. And he authored or co-authored more essays in this seminal 2018 volume than did any other contributor. He told me today to hold tight to this because it's a very rare book. Now, <clears throat> um, it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Gutierrez to the podium. Thank you, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. I would like to thank Dr. Mary Miller, director, and Dr. Andrew Turner of the Getty Research Institute for their kind invitation to participate in the catalog of this remarkable exhibition and to speak with you today about this fascinating document. I also would like to thank Dr. Baltasar Brito for inviting me to participate in the project, as well as all his efforts to make this research possible. Similar thanks go to Sofia Martinez del Campo and each one of my colleagues from the Departamento of Prehistoria of the Instituto Nacional de Antropología e Historia and Instituto de Esteticas and Lema from the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México. It was a great experience to collaborate with so many colleagues who came together to under, undertake one of the most complete interdisciplinary investigations of a pre-Columbian book. Finally, I dedicate this talk to the memory of Professor Michael Coe, whose instincts about the Codice Maya de Mexico 54 years ago triggered a chain of unexpected events that happily brought us all together here today and tomorrow. All right, let me just speak. All right, there you go. As of 1964, there were only three known surviving pre-Hispanic Maya codices in the libraries and museums of Europe. And we still do not know when or how these documents were transported overseas. Given how few pre-Hispanic Mesoamerican manuscripts have survived, it is not surprising that when the Mexican collector Jose, Josue Sainz Treviño, then president of the Mexican Olympic Committee, that guy over there, he used to hang with presidents and all that stuff, right? Uh, and he created a huge collection that you can now visit in Puebla in the Museo Amparo. So, uh, it is not surprising that when the Mexican collector Jose Sainz Treviño, then president of the Mexican Olympic Committee, acquired a fourth Maya Codex around 1965, nobody believed a real codex had surfaced from the Piedmont between the states of Chiapas and Tabasco, Mexico. Jose Luis Franco, an appraiser in the booming market of Mexican antiquities, in the 1950s and 1960s, re rejected its authenticity upon visual inspection. The physical anthropologist Eusebio Dávalo Surtado, then director of the Museo, Museo Nacional de Antropología, expressed skepticism as well. 
and here we have exactly uh, Eusebio Davalos Hurtado, and uh, that's Professor Coe, and his wife, Sophie. Davalos told archaeologist Michael Coe about the existence of the document in, the 19, in, 1907, in 1967. Coe visited Science Trevino in the fall of 1968 and examined the codex. Science Trevino provided Coe with black and white photographs, which Coe then showed to the Maya epigrapher Floyd Lonsbury. Despite previous negative opinions, Coe and Lonsbury assessed these four Maya codex as genuine based on the presence of a valid 584 days synodic calendar of the planet Venus and its prediction of the four apparent positions in the sky. The Venus tables of this new codex also coincided with the canonical cycle depicted in the Venus tables of the Codex Dresden. In addition, Cole obtained a radiocarbon sample from one of the blank pages of the codex, which provided a C14 date of 1230 plus minus 130 years AD. With this to distinguish Yale University researchers supporting the authenticity of the document, Science Trevino decided to lend the codex to the Grolier Club of New York for an exhibition in the spring of 1971. This was a bold move, but perhaps done at the worst possible moment for an attempt or an attempt to outtrace the clock because the document, the document left Mexico just before the just before two international treaties to prevent trafficking in cultural properties went into effect. An article published by the New York Times on 21st April 1971, Manuscripts Could Change Views on Maya Religion, made public the presence of a possible Mexican pre-Hispanic codex on display at the Grolier Club. Of course, Mesoamerican scholars were abuzzed with questions, what new Maya codex, where did it come from? If the document was Mexican, how did it leave Mexico? At that moment, very few Mexican archeologists even knew uh, about the existence of the supposed Maya codex. And those who did, were, uh, and those who did know uh, were skeptical about its authenticity. The exhibition of the codex brought long-term legal consequences for Science Trevino, who was not reappointed to his government position in 1972. He had to surrender the Grolier Codex to Mexican authorities and write a detailed account of how he had acquired. Upon the codex return to Mexico in the spring of 1973, the Mexican Federal Police seized it from the INA and kept it in, a, in custody for almost 18 months. This legal action thwarted any serious studies, any serious study of the document for several years. And I think Baltasar is gonna talk more about this tomorrow. Simultaneously to the return of the document to Mexico, Cole published color plates of the Grolier Codex in his book, The Maya Scribe and His World. The codex originally had at least 20 painted pages of which one 10 have survived, only 10 had survived, together with five blank pages. The plates were accompanied by a brief analysis related to the canonical Venus synodic period of 584 days, divided into four positions. Morning star, Venus rising ahead of the sun, in the east for 236 days. Superior conjunction, when Venus is behind the sun with respect to the position of Earth and is not visible for 90 days. Even in a star, when the planet is visible in the west after sunset for 250 days. And inferior conjunction, when the planet is orbiting between Earth and the Sun and is not visible for eight days. After the publication of the Maya scribe, the well-known Mayanist Eric Thompson challenged the authenticity of the Grolier Codex. He found it suspicious that the codex depicted representations of all four stations of Venus. 
He also claimed he knew of no Mesoamerican vigesimal system that represented the 20s positions with dots only, instead of the typical classic period bars and dots system. However, Thompson's primary attack against the Codice Maya de Mexico was one initially offered by Jose Luis Franco, the appraiser in Mexico City, who argued that the document was produced with pre-Hispanic paper looted from caves in the state of Guerrero and then painted by forgers during the 1960s. Hence, radiocarbon dating was not valid for authenticating this codex. Many of these early discussions about the Codice Maya de Mexico also focused on, attempt, on, on accepting or dismissing this document based on its hybrid Maya central Mexico iconography and style. These iconographic and calendrical arguments were exhausted by 2017 with neither, suppo neither supporters nor critics able to sway the opinion of the other side. Both groups demanded scientific analysis to settle the debate. Although previous material analysis had been attempted, the results had been inconclusive, primarily because no team could demonstrate the presence of Maya Blue in the codex between 1985 and 2007. In 1985, the laboratories of the Departamento de Prehistoria of the INA produced a report on pigments in the Grolier Codex based on destructive analysis of microsamples that inferred the presence of Maya Blue, but it was ignored by later, later researcher, research teams. I mean, they are seen here, Arcilla Coloreada, possiblemente Maya Blue, but that's because it was res it resisted every acid that they added to this guy, and that's the nature of Maya Blue. It resists absolutely everything except fire. I call it the vampire. <laughs> Omissions of this earlier analysis was particularly detrimental since it delayed the authentication of the codex and led to misdirected efforts by academics two decades later. Nobody went to read this document. Maya Blue is a lake pigment produced by combining an organic indigo dye, and I went to a nice trip to Niltepec to get real indigo from Mexico, with an inorganic framework of fibrous clay, paligorskite, or sepulite, or both of them together, as I was talking with, uh, I was talking with our colleague um, from Italy, and, uh, and we were talking about like, how the mystics mix these two together. Uh, Davide. Maya blue was widely used in Mesoamerican mur mur murals, ceramics, and codices from roughly AD 150, but uh, we are still skeptical about that date, all the way to seven, 1750. And it is thought to have been a prestigious substance because the pigment is often seen in the depictions of elites or deities. Each time a new document emerges from an archive, library, or private collection, investigation immediately needs to begin so as to understand the extraordinary circumstance of its survival and corroborate its authenticity. For the Grolier Codex, now renamed the Codice Maya de Mexico, this process took 54 years. Here, I summarize the methodology and scientific techniques used by the, the team of the University of Colorado Boulder, which participated in the INA coordinated project to test the Codice Maya de Mexico and evaluate its authenticity during the 2017 and early 2018 study. And tomorrow we, you will hear other colleagues from INA explaining their own research. Many of the approaches involved non-destructive spect spectroscopy, which is the study of spectra produced when matter interacts with electromagnetic radiation. 
the exploration of the Codice Maya de Mexico with portable instruments inside the vault of the Biblioteca Nacional de Antropología e Historia, INA, also helped guide the collection of samples for further destructive analysis, especially C14 dating. Originally, the A AMS C14 dating, one of the most effective tools of modern archaeology, was dismissed because Thompson argued that the paper used to produce the codex was obtained from looted caves where pre-Hispanic paper might have survived. Additionally, Thompson used subjective parameters to claim that the codex, the codex was a forgery, including the perception that the stucco was too well preserved or shiny to be pre-Hispanic, an invalid statement, especially if one has seen the document in person and Thompson had not, and you uh, had the opportunity today to see it, and if you have not done so, please don't leave the building without going and see the, the document. The only viable material left to evaluate the authenticity of the codex was to test for the presence of Maya Blue. But how could the presence of this synthetic lake pigment be used to authenticate this codex? primarily because no one understood the components or production of this pigment until after the Grolier or Codice Maya de Mexico first came to light in the late 1960s, meaning the pigment could not have been forged. And uh, we began to know something about this guy really uh, first, the first time that somebody said, hey, this material is completely different than anything that we have seen ever before happening in uh, 1931. But um, it was until 1966 that Van Hoffen managed to produce the vampire, I'm telling you. Things that can resist every single substance that destroy other objects, I mean, acids, bases, bleaches, uh, uh, it survives it, except fire. So, uh, 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 but at that point, it's like already we knew that the document was circulating in, in Mexico. It had already been brought to the house of, of, of science Trevino. So no, nobody could have actually know how to make Maya Blue, but I have more for you. Therefore, the presence of Maya Blue pigment can be used as a parameter terminus antequem, which is the latest possible date when the pigment was used historically to test whether the Codice Maya de Mexico is a fake. Maya blue was used in Mexico until the early 18th century. Hence, the green-blue color in the codex is the product of a synthesis of polygors and indigo. And this green-blue color proves to be resistant to acids and corrosives. Then, the Codice Maya de Mexico was produced no later than AD 1750, so we made that a hypothesis. If there is Maya Blue, because we didn't know how to make Maya Blue earlier, therefore, uh, we cannot falsify this codex, right? Using Lakatos terminology. If the previous condition is fulfilled, we can legitimately use AMS C14 dating to estimate the age of the paper of the codex. This would also allow us to invalidate Thompson's belief that the paper was pre-Hispanic, but the stucco and pigments used in it were modern and produced by a forger in the 1950s or 1960s. In addition, the codex should present neither modern substances introduced into Mexico during the European colonial system, nor industrial colors as part of its manufacture as these copies of the 1950s and 1960s. Let me tell you something about these copies. They were produced by the greatest copist of Mexico. I mean, Porfirio Aguirre, my gosh, I mean, this guy knew his business. He was originally an archaeologist, but he, he got into trouble for some things. And, uh, uh, but 
his uncle produced all the copies who went to the Colombino Junta in the 19th century in Madrid. So they, if there is, there was one person who knew or could have known how to manufacture pigments to make them look like real, it was this guy. I analyzed one of his documents in Guerrero and he's already using white titanium. So it's like, nope. Then 10 years later, Agustin Lopez Resendi is also a great artist. He was already, he, this guy was already using white zinc. So they didn't know how to produce blues without the assistance of modern uh, paints. Or as in the case of Cores Cardona, which I analyzed with Dr. Brito this summer, and found it to be the worst fake ever. <laughs> I mean, it's like, all right, this is supposed to be here. This is supposed to be kind of like how the paper becomes old. This is supposed to be the aging process of the paper, right? Wrong, because it's like they painted it. I can't even see the fingerprints there. I can pass this to the FBI now, and we can know who actually painted this guy. <laughs> I hope he's dead now. <laughs> oh, I mean, just be, so he cannot go to prison, right? <laughs> All right, so it's like, uh, uh, yeah, I, I mean, it's like, at this point, it's like really, uh, I know we are creating super forgers for the future, but we still can catch them. Okay, talking now about, about the Corte Maya de Mexico and the studies that we did. Our XRF elemental analysis of the Codice Maya de Mexico and the mapping of the elements present in the document indicate that the Imprimatura, the first paint layer of the codex was prepared with calcium and sulfur, indicating a stucco of gypsum. We also noted a high level of potassium, especially where the fibers were exposed or where the stucco was damaged. And here it is. The presence of potassium, and the, 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 here is the, the white and the blue is where you, we have most potassium. The presence of potassium was originally reported as suspect by Dr. Jose Luis Rubalcaba Sil and his team from the Instituto de Física of the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de Mexico. They believed that it had been added as a component of artificial inks to make the document look older. Just as we saw with the Cardona, right? So if that's true, we, we would expect to see this kind of fluorescence in the document. Let's see if, if we can see that. Do you see that? No, it's the opposite. We disagree with Rivalcaba and his team. Instead, of, instead, we interpret the presence of potassium as deriving from two sources. One, the fibers, the fibers themselves are potassium. But not only that, the fibers of the bark paper of the codex itself, bark paper, needs to be boiled in water with ashes to soften the fibers and eliminate the latex or, of cambium. Ashes are rich in potassium. So we have, the fiber itself has, has potassium. Plus, they have to be washed with water with ashes. We add more potassium, right? and then the excrement of insects, which also contain potassium. So potassium is well explained without the need of the hypothesis of an ink. Water damage to the stucco and the presence of biological activity, especially insects, provide be a better explanation for the pattern of ultraviolet absorbance and fluorescence on the surface of the codex, rather than the hypothesis of an ink applied by a forger to make the stucco look older. The Codex Imprimatura or of calcium sulfate had been used to argue its inauthenticity because the other three known Maya codices have an Imprimatura of calcium carbonate. Nonetheless, this assumption can be discarded when we learn, for example, that a segment of the 16th century Codex Quauxicala had an imprimatura of calcium sulfate, while calcium carbonate was detected in another section of the same codex. So we have like this craziness 
in the border between Hidalgo and Veracruz, where they created the first part with an imprimatura of calcium sulfate, and then the last part of the codex was created with an imprimatura of calcium carbonate. What about that? All right. This only demonstrates that our sample of colonial and pre-Hispanic codices is small and we cannot yet argue for strict canons of book production in Mesoamerica. Photomicrography and microscopy disapproved the idea that metal tools were used to cut the codex. Instead, the activity of possible arthropods was detected. And here we have, okay, oh God. Going back again with the poor Cardona, the worst fake ever. You see, that's cutting with, a t with metal tools, all right? This is not cutting with metal tools. This is activity of arthropods. I'm putting the silver, the silver fish just an example of an arthropod. It is not that we found evidence that the silver fish created this. But this guy was going around my library and I caught it and he had to pay the consequences of that. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, he, I took beautiful photographs of him and also uh, I, I smashed him and, and managed to get like <laughs> his teeth. So you can see, uh, you can see that these guys, they, they have powerful masticatory uh, 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 apparatus that can bore easily into whatever you put on them. They, they love cellulose, so take, be, take, be, be careful with your books, okay? So, biological activity is present on every page of the codex as insect excretions. I mean, here, poor silver fish at the same scale of the document, and, and, and you can see that the guy is really having a joyful moment with the document. <laughs> it's like, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna say what I was thinking. Okay. <laughs> okay, following this observation, the team from the Departamento de Prehistoria uh, of Ina, that was uh, uh, Alba, I mean, she has uh, uh, really microscopic eyes, uh, recovered a mite in the codex paper later identified by an UNAM ethno ethnomo entomologist as a possible parasite of, of a larger organism. And he was mentioning that it, perhaps it was one of those beetles who liked to be around dead bodies. Clearly this codex followed a different path than those documents that made it to Europe during the 16th century. It is possible that this document had been one of a group of objects deposited in a tomb. Another element, to, another, another element not observed by previous teams was that the organic red of the codex presents insoluble fragments of ground cochineal. This cochineal dye is also associated with possible traces of beeswax or the fat of the Mesoamerican lacquer insect, Yabela ashin or nig, or simply aje. And um, by the way, it's like, it's very difficult to separate actually with the infrared spectrometer, the uh, fat of the aje from the actual cochineal. It's, they almost have the same spectrum. This organic color was also fixed with a clay or alum as suggested by the presence of aluminum and silicon in the mixture. The clay might have been used to make the dye more viscous for its application, but we cannot disregard the presence of another lacquer pigment comprising the molecular bonding between organic and inorganic elements of this red-brown color. Just as Bernardino de Sagún described using cochineal mixed with greda, a type of clay, in the preparation of something that he called tlapashnetli, tlapalneshtli, or ashen red. And actually we have experimented with that, so we managed to uh, fix uh, cochineal in clays now, almost following the, the instructions of Sagun that were very scanty. So actually these guys, they have resisted already uh, uh, bleach and, 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 and uh, alcohol, so I think we did a good job here. So, the XRF and hyperspectral camera results proved the coeval use of two distinct red colors in the Codice Maya de Mexico, one of hematite and one organic, that's cochineal. 
which apparently form a couplet of paint similar to couplets observed in linguistic metaphors like in Lili, in Tlapali, the black, the red, to mean writing or book and wisdom. In this case, cochineal, nochestly in Nahuatl, is the blood of the nopal cactus, while red ochre is an iron mineral red that colors the, the rivers. As an example, a scene depicting a decapitation would combine the red rain of precious carmine, carmine with the red hematite blood that flows as a river. Similar use of two colors of the same hue, but created with different materials, was observed by Diana Magaloni in her study of the Codex Rees or Beinecke map. I have observed the same pattern in other Mesoamerican codices, such as the Codex Asoyu II and others. So this would be red, right? But we are in a false infrared color, so the, the hematite goes into a green color. This is the uh, cochineal. And these two that have like this kind of ruby color, they are mixing together the two colors. Uh, 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 and that's why it has like this kind of like uh, a special color. And you can see their spectrum with the XRF, they are completely different. A charcoal-based pigment to create the color black was inferred. Oh, by the way, here, here you can see also the red ochre and those gigantic crystals and how it shines when you see it from the best angle. Uh, a charcoal-based pigment to create the color black was inferred based on the observation that this color absorbed all the frequencies of energy using the multispectral analysis from high energy ultraviolet B starting at 250 nanometers to near infrared energy at 1,100 nanometers without any change of absorbance, a behavior typical of charcoal-based materials. I mean, Charcoal absorbs absolutely any, any energy that you put on it, right? Uh, and our colleagues from uh, the, uh, the Departamento de Prehistoria de, la, de Lina, they managed to finally uh, observe in the Raman uh, the crystalline and amorphous phase of charcoal. So it, is, it was well detected and well identified. Um, but anyway, this also cannot be detected by our XRF instrument because uh, the atomic weight of carbon is so light. Using UV fluorescence, we identified traces of an aerosol applied in 1973 by Ludovico Ferraglio of the Marine Gallery uh, in New York during conservation work that had not been previously reported. The owner of the gallery, the gallery, Edward Merrin, confirmed that Science Trevino paid for this intervention and the manufacture of the box to hold the document. Without the evidence of the UV fluorescence, we would not have known this conservation event took place. And actually, this is the first time that I contacted Professor Coe, and we asked him, we're finding some weird substance. Do you know if something happened to this document. Was, was there an event of, of conservation? And that's the moment in which he said, yes, the owner of the document, uh, 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 before it, the document was returned to Mexico, paid for a conservation event. And that's how we knew. But we caught it here. So we caught it here. It was like, really like, we, we, we look at this document like millimeter by millimeter, really. It's like, and, and not only me, Every single uh, 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 participant in the research teams look at this document with all their expertise, and, uh, and uh, uh, we all came to the same conclusions uh, uh, without having a conference, by the way. That was later. So anyway, a ghost impression of the Ick Day glyph from page 10b is observable on page 9 in areas that present high absorbance of UV light. This indicates that these two pages have been fused together by humidity. And you can see here, and uh, using different uh, ways to modify the color. We can even see some of the stucco there. And this is uh, uh, an uh, overlay of, of uh, the image, uh, the same glyph that is on the other page. All right, now, 
The XRF analysis of the green-blue color in the Codice Maya de Mexico detected the presence of magnesium, aluminum, and silicon, which together support the presence of a clay with magnesium, such as paligorskite or sepulite, but this instrument is not enough to actually prove that. The visual, the visual reflectance spectrometer showed the same pattern of electronic transition as other examples of blue pigment pres present in Mexican codices with a high absorption in the wavelength of 665 nanometers that corresponds well with absorption values in a state of excitation for the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital, LUMO, for the Colombino, for the Asoyu 2, and for the Quashicala codices that have Maya blue. When we compared these, blue, these values from these codices against the electronic transition of two laboratory reference samples of Maya blue, one produced with industrial polygorskite and the other produced with industrial sepulite, both with a weight concentration of 2% of indigo heated at 142 uh, uh, centigrades for 24 hours, and giving you the recipe to create a vampire, uh, 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 it was possible to observe that their electronic transition was closer to polygorskite than sepulite. Small differences in absorption result from the presence of impurities either in the sample use of mixed clays or minerals such as sepulite, dolomite, calcite, bentonite, or kaolin, variations in the concentration of raw materials, and or differences in manufacturing processes. But yeah, the Codice de Maya de Mexico is really made with paligorskite. Both the hyperspectral scanner and multispectral photography report the green color blue of page 10B of the Codice Maya de Mexico turning into the expected red, pink, depending on the filter you're using, in the false color infrared image. Moreover, no other materials or, or colors were found in the Codice Maya de Mexico. And in 18, 1985, the early INA team had reported that a blue pigment sample taken directly from page 10B had resisted the solubility test of six acids, two bleaches, eight organic solvents. Ah, oh, gosh, a resistance only observed in the Maya blue pigment. The many results of the testing support the identification of Maya blue in the document. Therefore, the Codice Maya de Mexico could not have been painted, painted in the 1950s or 1960s. And uh, this is a beautiful, I mean, when I saw this uh, 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 scatter electron microscope uh, image that uh, Alba uh, took together with, uh, uh, oh my God, I lost his name. Um, I was just like, ooh, we got it. We got it, that's it. Thompson and Franco's assumption, therefore, may be discarded. The results of the AMSC 14 dating of the Bark paper can be accepted and used to assign a relative chronology to the codex. A new set of AMS, AMSC 14 dates places the probable manufacture of this document in the early post-classic period of Mesoamerica between AD 1000 and 1200. But I will talk tomorrow about that. Now we have a, a, a better, better estimation of the moment in which the, the codex was created. And now we are talking about 1,102, 1,103. To that level we have arrived. And, and, and perhaps that is going to make Eric very happy, but he will say that tomorrow if he's happy or he's not. Um, so, Let's conclude this. All the evidence analyzed by the research teams of the University of Colorado Boulder, INA, and UNAM indicates that the Codice Maya de Mexico is an authentic Maya codex, the only one currently held in Mexico, and now here in California, right? To date, the Codice Maya de Mexico is now the most analyzed Mesoamerican codex by both non-destructive and destructive scientific methods. Its surface has been fully inspected millimeter by millimeter 
with a variety of microscopes by multiple independent specialists, many of whom you will hear from at tomorrow's symposium. The document has been examined with high resolution photomicrography, hyperspectral scanner, multispectral cameras, multiple microscopes were tested. Also, it was tested with a, a, a uh, attenuated total reflectance, Fourier transform infrared, very long name, micro Raman, scattered electron microscope, and energy dispersive X-ray spectrometry, and of course the solubility test. To date, the Codice de Maya de Mexico has been determined to be the oldest surviving pre-Hispanic book produced in the Americas. The major contribution of the Codice Maya de Mexico to our archaeological knowledge is that it provides us a glimpse of a transitional moment between the collapse of major, of major Maya centers of the Petén and the organization of political complexity during the turmoil of the early post-classic period. The Codice Maya de Mexico is truly a time capsule that can provide more insight on a troubled time in Mesoamerica. Thank you very much. Gerardo, that was just such a tour de force. I'm thinking, my gosh, uh, all of the science that it has taken to prove um, beyond a shadow of a doubt the authenticity of this manuscript. I wondered if be, um, we'll take some questions and anyone who wants to come down speak their microphones here. But while people kind of gather their thoughts, uh, could you talk a little bit about the size of sample it took in 1971 when Professor Coe had the paper analyzed and the kind of destructive sample it would take today or in the period in which you and your colleagues were working? Oh, sure. Well, it's like, uh, uh, this is just based on what I, I have read from Professor uh, Coe, but I, I think it took a little bit like, uh, a little bit less than half a page of the, one of the blank uh, uh, pages of the codex. And uh, the smallest sample that we pro processed was, oh my gosh, 1.6 milligrams, which is just like a splinter, just one of the splinters of your fingernails, pretty much. That's the size of sample that we use today. And in 1985? So, yeah, you, you need a lot of sample. <laughs> so, so it's like, a, 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 the, 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 I mean, we have to wait first. Uh, remember that the, we have a lot of regulations in, in, in Mexico to be able to do some kind of invasive analysis of these documents, right? So we didn't have those earlier. So we, we, we had to wait, and actually it's going to be great to, talk, uh, uh, to hear the talk of David Domenici tomorrow because uh, he is one of the pioneers in this non-destructive non analysis in, in, in the codices in Europe. And uh, we have to wait for this technology to be available. So it, it, that's why I'm telling you that in addition to all the gossip and political situation of the codex, uh, we had to wait until now to have all these instruments that allow us to uh, uh, detect substances at, at this point, the new generation that is coming out today, we just need a, 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 a kind of like, uh, if you have, we need 0 0.1 milligrams uh, 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 to detect materials now. So it's, it's just we're in, a, in the middle of this uh, uh, instrumental revolution. And, and that's why we could do this today. Yeah, Gerardo, thank you for that wonderful talk and just so lively and fun to this incredible uh, scientific collaborations. Um, I'd love to talk more about the science, but actually my question is that asking for a little cheese may maybe? Um, because I was really intrigued to hear Jose Luis Franco's name mentioned as one of the people who uh, questioned the authenticity way back when. And so I've you know, seen his name involved in 
pieces that were sold in France. And so he was working with dealers outside of the country. So I'm wondering, like, do you have any idea what his motivations might have been in um, challenging the codex? Like, did he have any beef with science or anything like that? Like, what do you think that he was? Um, what is the name of the person? I think Jose Luis Franco. Jose Luis Franco. So he was working with um, dealers yeah. in Mexico yeah. and yeah. outside yeah. of Mexico. Yeah. I think Megan's final line was, did he have a beef with science? <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, uh, OK, so so th this guy was, was used to be an archaeologist, and, and he, he, he wrote articles on Mexican ceramics. Uh, uh, but somehow he was doing appraising of of objects. I mean, it's like, let's remember that this was not illegal. So uh, it became illegal until 1972, 73, uh, uh, and nobody was paying attention to that law even then, right? So before in the 1950s, 1960s, when the market was hot, uh, uh, they were hiring archaeologists to do the advising and appraising of what to buy because it's like uh, collectors wanted to buy things that were good in addition to be beautiful, right? So I don't know what is the, the, the motivation for uh, Jose Luis Franco to have dismissed the codex. The only information I have is that he was just there one, one, one afternoon for a couple of hours and the only thing that he brought was a microscope, right? And, and it's like, that's not enough to say if, if something is real or, or, or fake. Now, we have been waiting for all these hundreds of pages of looted paper from Guerrero to show up. And, and let's go back to this guy, because this is actually amazing, because this guy came out in the 1980s, but we now know that perhaps it was manufactured uh, uh, after 1975. Okay, this guy was created with 806 pages of a matte paper. All right. All right, this would be like the perfect candidate to have used that old paper, but it did not. And tomorrow I'm going to show you how we cut them that they are using modern paper. And uh, uh, so I, I don't know, perhaps like uh, uh, they had bad dealings and uh, uh, Trevino didn't pay him some <laughs> advice previously. I, 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 I honestly don't know. Thank you. Kim, I think you're next. Or not Kim, sorry, I saw the hand. Yo, yo voy a hablar en español, so sorry. Este, Gerardo, me, para el, todo el público que está aquí presente, con la ilusión de que algún día podamos colaborar con ellos en otros proyectos, lo que era el Departamento de Prehistoria que desapareció hace 30 años, hoy se llama Subdirección de Laboratorios y Apoyo Académico, que es donde yo trabajo. Entonces, te digo, es, es, quiero hacer esa aclaración porque si alguno de los presentes quiere que les echemos la mano para un estudio, pues es la subdirección. Departamento de Prehistoria era cuando tú estabas en México y eras estudiante todavía. Y, y el otro asunto que quiero comentar es que recuerda y mañana lo vamos a ver con mucho detalle, que el soporte pictográfico del Código Maya de México no está hecho con, eh, de la manera tradicional. Entonces, no usaron eh, ceniza para elaborarlo. Entonces, tengo una idea, y eso después lo platicamos tú y yo, de dónde puede venir el potasio que tienes esos picos, mm. pero definitivamente no viene de la ceniza que utilizan, digamos, en la actualidad o que usaron a partir de la colonia para ablandar el papel, porque allí están, y mañana, insisto, lo vamos a ver con mucho detalle, cómo el, 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 la elaboración es totalmente diferente a, a el, la, el común de los papeles prehispánicos. Bueno, ¿vale? pero voy a estar en desacuerdo contigo, porque eh, yo sí he visto cómo hacen el papel… Okay. <laughs> quick, quick bit of All right. So what, what, what my colleague, yeah. my, what, what my colleague uh, Susana is, is 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 telling me is that um, um, we are going to see tomorrow actually because I'm going to present also some part of this. There there are two ways to create a matte paper, right? The a matte paper of the highlands of Mexico, the trees are 
kind of uh, 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 not as thick and they take longer to grow uh, 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 different than what happens in the Gulf of Mexico or in the Yucatan Peninsula. So in the Yucatan Peninsula, the trees grow kind of like it takes two to three to four years to achieve the size in which they can provide a large piece of, of amate paper. And they use completely different techniques to extract it, but the boiling uh, with ashes still happens even in the, uh, 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 the Yucatan Peninsula. So, es que en la, en la península de Yucatán todavía, aunque le sacan el papel completo, y, y tú viste las fotos, pero las voy a enseñar mañana otra vez, sacan un pliego completo de casi 90 centímetros por casi 2 metros 20 en cada, de cada pedazo. De todas maneras, tienen que removerle el, cam, el cambio. Entonces, todavía hay este... El cambio es la parte que está viva del árbol, que es donde crece la fibra que se usa para el papel. So the cambio is the living part of the tree, and that's the one that is used for the elaboration of the paper. But that thing has this kind of latex that produces the, 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 the tree produces, and that has to be removed. And uh, the best way to remove it is to put it in water, but the boiling part as far as I, I am concerned, I have seen it that they, they still use it even with the large piece of, 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 of paper. Yeah. Seguimos, seguimos. Proponemos que el papel fue el ensamblado de las tres capas de la que está formado, fue hecho en fresco, utilizando precisamente látex. Eso es lo que no queremos quitar, porque el látex es pegajoso, muy pegajoso. Entonces, el ensamblado fue en fresco, nunca quitaron este, el látex con, con ceniza. Esto es, en las, después de la colonia, que introducen ya las técnicas de elaboración de papel, es cuando ya empiezan esta, estos procedimientos, pero es evidente que en el papel maya fue elaborado prácticamente al mismo instante que cortaron y sacaron las cortezas para pegarlo. Entonces, te digo, yo tengo una idea de dónde puede provenir ese sí. potasio, pero seguramente eh, 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 no, no lo hirvieron. Eh, the, 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 el, el, what she's saying is that, uh, um, that they believe that the… Her, Gerardo, I just want to say we are having a very interesting conversation here between Susana Shawansi, who is featured in the movie, <laughs> in the exhibition, and, so, and, and, and Gerardo, um, and that this is actually going to continue tomorrow as well. I'm not sure we can get to the bottom of everything today. <laughs> Um, but it really, the, which, which trees have gone extinct and how the pieces of paper for the, the, the large pieces of bark were yeah, taken yeah. From, for the Maya documents in order to make things like the Dresden Codex or the Codice Maya de Mexico. Please, go ahead, but I just... Yeah, so, so what, what my colleague is, is, is saying is that they, they, they believe that in the particular case of the Codice Maya de Mexico, the large pieces of paper that they can get, and you're going to see tomorrow the, the photographs, uh, 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 um, the, that the, the, the cambium or the, la the latex of the, of the paper was not really removed, but it was left, and that was kind of the glue that managed to maintain the, uh, the three layers of paper that the Codice Maya de Mexico has. Um, I disagree with that because one of the things that latex has is that it stinks like shit if in 24 hours, 48, 40, 40, 48 hours. So it's like, and it does not, it, we would have a different trace. Now, the fiber itself has potassium, I need to tell you. If you take, take whatever fiber and put it in the XRF, you're gonna get a, a pickup of potassium. The question here is that the imprimatura of calcium sulfate is uh, 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 produces enough absorbance of the X-ray fluorescence to prevent you to heat the fiber. That's why Jose Luis Robalcaba and myself, when we were going through the areas of the imprimatura that are not damaged, we were not getting that peak of, of, of potassium. But once you approach to the area that is damaged, that's when the potassium piece picks up. And that's why Professor Rubalcaba thought, oh my gosh, I, we got them. They are using an ink uh, uh, to fake this damage. And, uh, but, but these guys are using an ink to fake <laughs> this damage and not the other document. Yes. So, um, do we have other questions? 
I, I have to say, um, there's just going to be such interesting, such interesting discussion continuing tomorrow at Cal State. Uh, please register, figure, um, I, I, and, and we really are eager to see this conversation about the oldest book in the Americas. And you know, I say that not, not thinking, oh yeah, and then someday they're gonna test the Codex Dresden, and someday they're going to test the Codex Madrid. I think stylistically, I feel very confident that even if the other known books were to be tested in the same way, which I don't expect to happen, that the book that we have here at the Getty and that this incredible scientific work has been done on will um, withstand a little bit of the uh, slings of time and prove to be uh, the oldest book of the Americas. So thank you, Gerardo.